Canadian men who have won worlds, there must be uh, four, five, uh, six. How many men have won? Uh, Don Jackson, that was the first one. Brian Orser, Kurt Browning, myself, Jeffrey Buttle, and Patrick Chan, so there'd be six. One more that I'm missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can name them. Donald McPherson, Donald Jackson, me. Six or seven. I'll go with six. Six, final answer. <laughs> Kurt, Elvis, Jeff Buttle, Patrick Chan. So seven of us. Oh, that's right. Man, I always go with your first instinct. They, I don't know, I think <laughs> they have, uh, they've all played a role in my career. They're all world champions, now that I think of it. They're all world champions, which is phenomenal. No man has won an Olympic gold medal for Canada. Statistically, you would think that there would be a lot more Olympic gold medals, that's for sure. Guilty. <laughs> it does boggle the mind that we haven't done it yet. Zero. <laughs> I know it's something, isn't it? Uh, the Olympics are weird. They are. They're the, you know, they're the, the triangle out there in the Bermuda Triangle. Zero. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That I think it's time. I think it's time for a Canadian to finally step up to the to the to the podium and um, and and do it. Time to step up. For Patrick Chan, that moment has arrived. He's jogging. It's been a long time coming. I accomplished a lot of things. As he collected three world championships and a load of other figure skating titles too. But the pressure, the spotlight, has been intensifying as well. If he's feeling the heat, he's not showing it. I'm very confident, very positive. There's really only one ending to this script that will satisfy Chan. And for me, Olympic silver, Olympic bronze isn't really going to do it because Honestly, I've won three world championships. I've been at the top. I've been getting used to being chased. So I just wanted to continue that. So yeah, I, I, I don't feel comfortable we're not, we're not winning. <laughs> the thing is, Canada has seen this movie before. The hype, the expectations, then the burden of falling just short. Oh my gosh. Um, Brian Orser. Brian Orser, Battle of the Brines. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, 1988. <laughs> I was born in 1990. <laughs> Brian Orser carrying Canada's flag. He's our champion. He's our favorite for an Olympic gold medal. Well, if you are old enough to remember 1988, it was Canada's first winter home games. And who better to carry the flag? Brian Orser. He already had an Olympic silver medal from Sarajevo. This time, carrying the hopes of a nation for gold. Of course the Olympics have pressure, but this was even more special with the pressure because it was at home, I was the reigning world champion, I was the only reigning world champion from our entire team. I look back at that time and it's all like an out-of-body experience when I see this very young, thin guy skater in a red costume and I look back and I go, I, who is that and how did he, that person manage that, that pressure? The Battle of the Bryans lived up to its billing, an epic duel that came down to the last moments of competition. A very famous jump that he does, a triple out with hand extended First, the American, Brian Boitano. There would be very little room for any judge to put any skater over this performance. Then, Brian Orser, Mr. Triple Axel, Olympic gold still within reach. Now Brian Orser, who must put out the performance of his life now. I'd done the program so many times in practice, and all that was left was just to try to create that magic that happens. And for a moment, he thought he had it, but... This was the first mistake, a very costly mistake. I made one little small error, and there was no room for error. I think then with that type of judging system, the Olympic champion does not make a single mistake. And I did make a small mistake. And so I kind of like did this. <laughs> it was like a relief. And I was kind of hoping and praying that it was enough. It was not. By a razor thin margin, Boitano won gold, Olympic gold. And so I did the what if thing for a long time and it kind of made me crazy. And so I got to the realization that they, it is what it is. 
And it took me 10 years before I could watch a videotape of my free program because it was very painful and it was um, disappointing and I felt like I had let a lot of people down, including myself, my family, my town, my country. And, and then, I, then it took me some time and just maturity, I guess, to realize that it was good. It was okay. And I did my best. Kurt Browning is one of my best friends in the skating world. Uh, if Kurt had had the tools that I think I have now today as, um, as, as fit as I am off the ice as well as on the ice, he, he would have most likely won an Olympic gold medal. Kurt Browning, first man to do four revolutions, the quad in competition. That was the quad. And holder of four world titles. By so many accounts, incomparable on the ice. And yet in three Olympics, not in Calgary, not in Albertville, not in Lillehammer, not a single medal. 1992 was it. That was when I was going to win. Uh, 1992, uh, I was the right age, had it going on, and, and, uh, and then the injuries came. And uh, six weeks before those Olympics, I couldn't push clutch down on my truck with my left leg, let alone jump for a triple axle. And in Albertville, I think I was in a daze. I was in a, a tortured daze of, I'm not ready for this. I know I'm not ready for this. My back wouldn't let me prepare. My practices haven't been good. And I'm hoping for a Hail Mary miracle here. A miracle was not to be. Uh, I wanted it, but but I knew the that realistically in 1992 that it probably wasn't going to happen. So it was a real mixed bag of emotions. My family was a mess. Uh, I was obviously a mess and we were, we were scared. We were being put up against the wall in front of the world and uh, we didn't have anything to fight with. So it, it wasn't fun. Didn't like it. Didn't enjoy it. A couple of years later, another go. In Lillehammer, before the short program, I in the five-minute warm-up, I took a crazy fall that I never take. And I, you know, was just trying to shake that off and wrap my head around it, and I didn't quite do that. Connecting steps into the triple flip, he's had some problems with this. By then, expectations were so great that in those moments of realization that Olympic disaster oh. had struck again. He didn't need that, wow. Only a national apology seem to suffice. I know a lot of people are sad in Canada and uh, sorry, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Oh, the I'm sorry line? The famous, the famous I'm sorry? <laughs> when I come home and have a party. I mean, people uh, so many times have said you shouldn't have said that or you didn't need to say that or we didn't need to hear that. Uh, I'm like, well, it's not like I sat up all night and thought if I skate bad, this is what I'm going to say. I mean, it just kind of flowed out and it was because I was. I was dreadfully sorry. <laughs> Elvis, who inspired uh, in 98, and he, uh, talk about mental toughness. I mean, that's your role model for mental toughness. I remember watching it on TV and it was shocking because uh, he could have pulled out, you know, he could have just given up. Elvis Stoiko, through four Olympics, he impressed the fans, if not always the judges. Still, in Lillehammer, he captured a silver. This is actually the biggest scrum I've ever seen in my life. And going into Nagano, remembered as the heavy favorite for gold. And I'll be honest, in 98, it was very, very difficult for me to stay focused on that track uh, because everywhere I turned, was go for the gold, win the gold, he's going for the gold. He's trying to become the first male skater to win Olympic gold for Canada. There was massive expectations for me because everyone was saying it's now or never and do or die. Defending world champion, he never ceases to amaze. Not so well known, what Nagano ended up costing him. And this is Elvis Stoiko's skate for Olympic gold. The pressure, a lingering groin injury. He opens with a triple Lutz. A bout with the flu. Even today, Stoiko's not sure how he endured. 
out of my whole career, it was the only time where I was actually scared because I had no idea what was going to happen. And uh, I had worked so hard up to that point and my heart was like, I'm not giving up, I don't care. If I'm scared, I don't care. Um, the pressure, I am going to go through this. Through the short program, then the long, his famous quad sacrificed, and so much more. Quad toe? What do we say? It's not there, and I don't know if he's got position in this program to attempt it again. I, was, I closed my eyes and I took a breath and I was like, I can still believe I can still do this. Even though I knew I hadn't done the quad, my body wasn't able to, didn't have enough power in my leg to create four revolutions, but I knew that I could still trust the training to complete a program that was, was clean without major error. There was a moment in the long program I was going into the second triple axel and I, I almost skated to the referee, I almost stopped and went to the referee, I can't continue. And I remember that moment very clearly because I said, you've got three jumps left. If you fall, I, I if I fell, I probably wouldn't have been able to get up. So I was like, just stay on your feet and just trust, trust your body because it's trained. And at that point, I just pushed through. He's thinking every step of the way. He's fighting every step of the way. That's why at the end, when I finished, my body knew, just get to the end of the music. When I finished, I, it took me everything not to collapse because I used so much energy to sort of defend against the pain. It, the, the wound started in 98 it, in the long program. That moment I finished, that was like my, I felt something literally break inside me. Elvis is not on skates, ladies and gentlemen. He is going to have to walk to get to the podium. Stoiko collected yet another Olympic silver medal. The physical toll clearly on display. The emotional toll buried. I have to admit from 98 to 2002, I wasn't myself. I was going through a really tough phase of um, dealing with why I was there. Because I was struggling with the fact that, yeah, I didn't win the gold and I wanted to achieve that. Um, and it became doing it for the wrong reasons again. So, stories revealed and lessons learned, perhaps. When we come back, what's the advice for Patrick Chan? If there's any advice for Patrick Chan in his quest for Olympic gold, it may best come from the men who made the journey before him those super achievers on the world stage, yet all fighting some sort of demon in the Olympic moment. Even Chan's choreographer has a world title. But from the Olympics, Jeffrey Buttle has a bronze. The gold would have been surreal, that would have been amazing, but, but for me it was more about finishing on the podium. <laughs> Buttle believes there's something special fueling Chan, something rare, elusive, something Buttle admits he himself did not have. That's great. Absolutely. I mean, he, he's a competitor and there's that hunger. He obviously wants that gold medal. And um, I think the hunger is important. The hunger is what carries you through the entire season of training. Uh, and I think, I think every time he steps out on the ice is, is sort of helping the process for once he gets there because that's really what it's all about is whether he can handle that kind of pressure on the ice and open open there brian orser has to be careful about any words of wisdom he shares with chan yeah i'm 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 between a rock and a hard place because i'm doing my job my job is now i'm a i'm a coach and i'm a i'm a high level coach <laughs> coach not just to one, but two of Chan's strongest challengers for Olympic gold, a Japanese champion and a Spanish champion. I'm going to sort of remain quite neutral on this. Of course, I want whoever wins, I want it to be the performance of the night. I want it to be the magical moment. Magic, that's the key, says Orser, that intangible ingredient that ends up separating the skater who shows up from the skater who shows up and wins. 
He says it happened with Boitano in 1988, and it will happen in Sochi, too. Can Patrick do it? Yes. Can Javier Fernandez do it? Yes. Can Yuzuru Hanyu do it? Yes. And it comes down to those few days at the games that, um, that you can stay strong, you can stay focused, and you can just take that a whole Olympic thing and just make it work for you. It's amazing the power of the Olympics that it can just lift you and carry you. And you can't teach that. You have to let them experience that. And then you can allow the magic to happen. Within the world of figure skating, nothing exists like this. This is special. In many ways, Kurt Browning has found the greatest post-Olympic success. His star on the Walk of Fame. A testament to his one-time domination of figure skating and so much more. As showman, choreographer, analyst. Today, Browning enjoys genuine celebrity status. And yet, with no Olympic medal, none of any color, you might wonder. My career? My career was, and I can say that because I'm near the end, was long and fun and full of support and love. Nah, nothing's missing. Um, nothing at all. I, I got to skate in front of the world and do what I did as a kid for fun, as an adult for a living. Nothing's missing. So in Browning's assessment, what should Chan do that he didn't, couldn't, on the Olympic stage? The pressure of the Olympics is there for everybody. I mean, it's there for everybody. So, um, you know, talking about the pressure is a moot point for me. It, you know, and it's how you bring your bag of laundry to the rink. It's how you stuff your worries into your luggage and pack it on the plane and go to Sochi. And that's, that's where the individual thing. If Patrick comes to me and just says something simple like, I'm not feeling it, man. Um, <laughs> first, I'd make him laugh somehow and uh and that's not hard for me to do with patrick and then i would just say probably dude do you like skating do you like people watching you skate then that's all you have to do today elvis stoiko's advice for chan comes after years of his own soul searching as he practices for an upcoming show stoiko knows figure skating has allowed him to make a good living but it took time and a move to Mexico to help heal his Olympic wounds. A shift in focus to other passions, other creative and physical outlets to help him turn a corner emotionally. Found a place that I needed to get away to be just me, away from skating and just start from the core. I, I'm not a skater, I'm just a person and I had to rebuild everything from that point. Um, yeah, I still skated, I still did shows, I still did other things, I tried other things, and that for me opened up another world of understanding about life. Uh, because when you leave skating, most skaters always say that, you end up leaving skating, you realize skating is this big, it's tiny compared to the rest of the world. But when you're in it, you think it's the only thing. It's not a matter of forgetting the past. In fact, Stoiko says he knows exactly what Chan is going through. Do I focus on the gold strictly? Do I focus on my skate? How do I balance that? Um, it, it's, it's a very fine line and he has to find that place, that balance for his, his mind to settle in. He, I'm sure every night before he goes to bed, he's thinking about it. He's thinking about what his body feels like in training, how he feels. He says he told Chan very directly, be prepared for Sochi, but not over prepared trust yourself. I remember talking with him and uh, I, told, I, I just was honest. I said, you're an easy target to compete against. And he's like, what? I said, you, you go out in, in, during the competition week and I know how you train. I said, you try to win every friggin' practice. And I said, doesn't matter what you do in practice. You can skate crappy all week. All that matters when that music goes on and it's ready to compete, you do your stuff. That's all that matters. True confidence knows I can do this. I can do this and I will do it. If some worry about how much Chan is prepared,
how much fun he's having, or even if there's going to be magic, if they're concerned about the burden of history, just take a look at the man himself and listen carefully. It's just skating, and, and the reason the Olympics is, uh, exists is to have fun, and, and it's all about competition. Um, it's not about life or death. So I have to remember that, and that helps me relieve the pressure um, and the expectations and kind of the weight on my shoulders. It, it lifts some of the weight off my shoulders and so that I can go to the Olympics and not be careful. I, I think it's important not to be careful and try to be perfect. It's all about stepping out and um, like a horse out of the gate and just going for it and going for my first quad and then going for the second quad um, without, second, without doubts and without worry. Patrick Chan, this is it. Time to take your bow. Prediction? <laughs> to, to make a prediction, everybody wants to know. I mean, Patrick, yeah, he has absolutely got a, a great shot at winning. Uh, prediction in my event, the men's event? Yeah, I just don't want to be the bad guy, okay? I want the best person, the best guy to win. It's funny, the Olympics bring out all your demons, and that's why you got to make sure you conquer those little buggers before you show up. I believe it's not that if he does it, I believe it's how he does it. I think um, <laughs> if Patrick's having fun, that he won't even notice the pressure. He'll just show off and probably win. He really is the one to beat at the Olympics this year. Patrick is actually in a very good place before the Olympics, and I'm proud of the journey that he's taken to get there. I want it to be a great moment in skating. If it's Patrick or anybody else, I just want it to be a great moment in skating. That's going to be the best part. That's going to be the cherry on top, being, bringing a gold medal, hopefully, to Canada. That's never been brought uh, to Canada.